Okay, let us continue with our makefile saga. We were right here learning how to make use the rules for makefiles, and now let's make a makefile to actually go and compile our library that we built up that does the binary search and linear search. So uh, we got to here, and uh, here's how we do it. So I've made a searching folder for the entire searching library inside of this lecture 26 folder, and uh, it has everything that we had before. The one thing we add now is a makefile. Okay? So the rule that we want to eventually use is we want to make a program called searching. Okay? And it requires that we have uh, made and compiled searching.o and main.o. Okay? So to make searching, we require searching.o and main.o. So we have it. And then once you have them, yeah, you tab over. So once you have all the requirements, run G++ appropriately to make searching. So the one thing that you need to do once you have those .o files is just to run G++, okay? This one line, given these requirements, will make the searching thing, which was the target, that was the name of the thing that we wanted to build, okay? So that's what we want. If we didn't have the .o files, how do we make those? So. Uh, That requires searching.cpp only. So to make searching.o, we require searching.cpp. OK. So and then once we have it, we just use the g++-c. And we do the same exact thing for uh, main.o. OK. And the beauty, the beauty of makefiles is it knows when things change, and it knows to make things that it doesn't have. OK. Okay, so if things change, it'll rerun only the appropriate things. Which is beautiful. So uh, here's our make file. Let's use it. So remember, it's just a file in our directory. Uh, can I show you? just one file it's called makefile okay that's the name of the file and how do we use it well there's a program that goes along with it it's called make okay to run a makefile we say make and then the name of the target that we want to build so or if it's the first rule like we specifically wrote this first rule to be the one that we really do want you can just say make and it'll run that one okay so you can say either make uh, make searching or just make and it will make the searching target. Okay? And let me let me show you it in action. Bam. It noticed it needed searching.o, it didn't have it. So it ran that rule. To make searching.o. It same thing for main.o. It didn't have it, so it ran its rule to make it. And then once it had everything, it ran its final rule to build the thing that we asked it to make. Beautiful, right? And then let's just change main again. Now let's have two new lines, for example. Uh, if I make searching again, it'll only recompile what's necessary. It knows what's changed. 
only main changed. So it didn't recompile searching.o. You see that? It's missing this. It didn't need it. So then it recompiles using its stuff, and we have searching with one extra new line. So that is the beauty of make files, and you can make these as advanced as you want. So uh, you can make special rules to get rid of compiled files. It's usually called clean. You say remove uh, every .o file and uh, searching. And now if you say make clean, it'll run that one rule, no requirements, and it will get rid of all the .o files and the searching thing. Say make searching again to recompile everything. Okay, uh, so that's a make file. It's really useful, and uh, I've made one for you in your lab. Okay, uh, with that, let's move on to complexity, where uh, we're going to have algorithms now, and we want to know exactly how fast they are. And uh, a better thing than just using a stopwatch and timing how long the algorithm took is to use math. So we're going to talk about that. And this is a, is a bit of an advanced topic. It's more of a 41 topic than a 41. So a 40 topic, that is. Uh, so if I test you on any of this, it'll be just with multiple choice questions from your book. OK. So the idea is we want to count the number of basic operations for linear search and binary search. A basic operation is uh, things like assignment, plus, minus, arithmetic, things like that. Uh, assignment, arithmetic, uh, condition, checking. It Usually, you can think of it as one line of code. Assuming that line doesn't do anything fancy like loop, or call a function that loops. So uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, we want to count these numbers of basic operations, and that will tell us mathematically how fast a function is. And usually there's a variable involved. Most often we use n, where which is the size of something. Or like the user input types n things, things like that. So there's usually an n somewhere. And the algorithm, like the number of basic operations, it depends on this thing called n. OK, so for example, if you're using linear search, and your array is of size 4, it's going to be completely different time-wise than if your array was of size 1 million. Does that make sense? So like n equals 4, n equals, I don't know, 10 to the 6. That's the idea. OK, so uh, we want to be able to count these basic operations for linear search and binary search. So, so let's, uh, let's do this. Let's go to linear search, and let me try to take a screenshot. I believe it's going to work. We're going to find out. Yes. OK, let's do the same for binary search while we've got it open. Oops. Beautiful. OK, let's do this now. So linear search depends on the size of the vector. Again, uh, what's going to happen is well, it's going to keep on looking through things. So it's uh, one basic operation to check for equality, like to access a vector and check for equality. That's like one operation. Maybe it's multiple. Like. Uh, it's all very hand wavy, I know, but uh, it does make sense if you think about it long enough. Like this, uh, this go to the vector, that's one operation maybe. And then 
uh, check for equality with a variable, that's another operation. So maybe that's two operations for that one line. Okay, two operations here. And then returning something, that's just one operation. It's a quick thing to do. Uh, so this is one. All right. Then we need to figure out how many times this for loop executes, because that'll tell us how many times these things happened. OK? So how many times does this for loop execute? It goes from 0 to v size. Well, that is how many times? n times total, yeah, because I've said that n is the size. OK, so that's n times. It's going to do the following. So in total, every time it executes this loop, at most, it does three operations, OK? Usually, it's going to be two. And then one last one, it's going to be three. But we don't have to worry about that. So at most, like it runs this entire loop to completion. It's really going to be like, uh, at most, the inner loop runs n times because we didn't find it, OK? Because we didn't find the value we're looking for. And so it did like n times 3 operations, OK? And then uh, we have one more plus 1 to return negative 1. This is very hand wavy. It's really n minus 2, right? Because it never is returning. But that's OK. It doesn't matter. So uh, yeah, in total, it's 3n plus 1 operations. So if n was large, you know that it's going to take a while, OK? Because every operation is like a, a CPU cycle. It takes a little bit. Okay. Or some small amount of time. Okay. So that's that. All right, now let's talk about binary search. So this requires a bit fancier of an idea. Uh, what it's doing at a high level is it's keeping track of how big its subarray is. So uh, we need to figure out how many times it executes its body eventually. Uh, let's just talk about the inside, the inside of the while loop. So it's going to take, I don't know, how many operations here. It's got to add two numbers and then divide them. So that's uh, two operations, maybe. Two operations for that. And then it's got to go inside of, uh, let's see, why don't I just keep this in white, actually. Let's just say that and that. That's like uh, two. And then it's got to do uh, an assignment and then also access a vector at an index. That's two again. And then it does a check here, potentially. That's one. And uh, this line has an assignment and a plus, which is two. If it ever does this else if, uh, it's going to be just checking if it's greater than. That's one operation, we'll say. And then here, it's an assignment and a minus. You don't have to keep track of what this really means uh, too much. It's just these are all numbers, countable numbers, like constants. OK? Uh, this is 2. And then else, there's no condition, so we don't check anything. We just go straight here, and it's one operation to return something. OK? So at most, I know it's not always the case, and it, it's totally not true. Uh, but at most, every body of the while loop uh, takes every execution of the body takes 2, 4, 2, 4, 8, 16, 17, 18, 19. At most, it'll always be less than uh, 19 operations. OK, at most. So now we just need to multiply this 19 by something. Uh, also up here, we have uh, an assignment 1, another assignment, and a function call 2. So 1, 2, 3, a minus 4. So let's call that 4 operations. 
for that one line. So you don't have to worry too much about, okay, what, what is an operation? What does this mean? Just that uh, these are all constant numbers. Okay, so uh, that's the idea. And uh, let's see here. Now we need to know how many times this while loop executes. So, because then we can just multiply that by 19. How many times does the while loop execute? It's body. And the idea is, the math is, that you start out with a subarray, like your low and high, of size n. And each time, each time you make a guess and you look in the middle, you're going to have it. It, depend, it doesn't matter if it was the left half or the right half that you chose. The next time it's going to be n over 2. Okay? Then you're going to look in the middle, and it's going to be slightly less than n over 2, but this is enough for now. And then you're going to look somewhere and like, okay, it was less than, uh, i got to go over here. So now it's n over 4. And then, okay, you're going to look in the middle of this, and eventually it's going to be n over 8. And eventually you're going to get to an array of size 1 or 0. And the idea is how many times can you have your search space and still have things in it? That is, divide in by 2. Uh, and still have something in it. And the answer is, I think if you think about this long enough, the answer is log base 2 times. Log base 2 of n times. So uh, I might be off by a constant, but that's not important might be log of base 2 of n plus 1 or something. But uh, this while loop, it's going to execute at most log base 2 of n times. OK? So that's the answer. Around log base 2 of n. So boop, that's the answer to this question. So the total in total, in total in the worst case, total is log base 2 of n times 19 plus 4. Okay, because it's the while loop. How many times does it execute its body? At most, it's doing 19 things inside of there and then 4 outside of it. Okay, I hope that makes sense. 19n uh, plus 4. Oh, sorry. 19 log base 2 of n plus 4. Okay, so now I encourage you to graph these two things. Linear search was 3n plus 1, which is a line, and then log base 2 of n. They're going to look quite different. They might be a bit, uh, like, pretend this is way zoomed out. So this is 3n plus whatever, plus 1, and then 19 log base 2 of n plus 4. Eventually, when n gets very large, it's going to take much less time. This is going to be like super, super small compared to that one. OK? And so binary search, even though this constant is large, this constant's large is going to be so much faster, OK? And the way that we say that in math is we use something called big O notation. So this is a 41 topic. Don't worry about it. It's just uh, here are the rules. If you, uh, you take the highest term and drop all the rest, and then from that highest term, you drop any constants out in front. So with this, uh, with this idea, that means that linear search 
it used to be 3n plus 1, it turns into, we drop any lower terms, which is the plus 1, that's much smaller than 3n, 3n dominates, so that's 3n, and then we say we get rid of any constants out in front, so that's just n now, okay? And then binary search, it's, it was 19 log base 2 of n plus 4, and that becomes 19 log base 2 of n, because we drop the lower order terms, because the log base 2 of n dominates. Then we drop anything out in front that, are, that is just constant, so that just becomes log base 2 of n. Okay? So, uh, big O is just a shorthand for programmers, computer scientists. To have like a, to get a general idea of how, fa how fast something grows. In CSI, we use this for algorithms. So we say that uh, linear search is big O of n. So we say that, and we write it like this. Big O of n, like that. Like it's a function you're calling. OK, so then for this one, it's we say binary search. Ah, it's tiny. Binary search is big O of log base 2 of n. Okay, so that's just like a general idea about how fast this function that represents our algorithm grows. Okay? That's all. Uh, so that's what I wanted to show you there. And uh, the last thing that I do want to tell you about is uh, how to actually use a stopwatch. So uh, time your algorithms. So uh, that is using C time. So that involves going to uh, the website and looking up C time. And uh, if we go there, there is a uh, function called clock. Okay, and there's a nice example of how to use it. If you call the clock function, it, it like records the time. And so if you record it twice and you subtract, uh, you'll get a certain amount of time. And then you just divide by clocks per second, because clock is not like a number of seconds yet. It's just like how many times your CPU executed or something. So uh, if we just divide by this, we end up with seconds. And so uh, that's the idea. So clock, the type that it returns is a special type called clock underscore t. So we just have to declare one of those. So you say uh, clock underscore t uh, start equals clock. Then you run your algorithm. Then you get the end. And then you have the seconds back at you if you do end minus start divided by clocks per sec. Okay. So I encourage you to like make some giant things and run binary search on them and linear search on them. And uh, you will notice the huge speed up that binary search gives you then. Okay. But you got to make sure those arrays are sorted. OK. Uh, yeah, I think that's all I wanted to say there. We're dividing by clocks per sec. And uh, let's see here. Oh, one of those, sorry. You have to use static cast as well. This one's got to be a double. That should do it. OK. Uh, all right, that is complexity. Uh, this is something that I won't test you very hard on, and uh, I just want to 
I want you to be ready for CSI 41 when you take that. Uh, we're going to talk a whole lot about that. And uh, then let's talk about sorting. Okay, so this is another thing that I'm not going to test you too hard on because this is more of like an algorithms class topic, but it's good to know that some sorting algorithms suck. Okay, uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to visualize these things. Okay, and so I have a, a nice, fun example website that I found, and we're going to visualize these algorithms. All right, so bubble sort really sucks, and uh, let me show you why. So it, what it does is it sorts an array by swapping elements that are right next to each other. So uh, this is how it works. It's like, okay, I have this array. It's 8, 4, I don't know, 2, 5, 3. And the idea of bubble sort is that it's just going to go and look. This is not C++ on the right. It's pseudocode. It, it's something that could be any language. If you just filled it in with the right, with the right stuff. So what it's going to do is uh, it's going to like keep two pointers into the array, one after each other, and it's going to just move those along. It's like, okay, is this index smaller, bigger or smaller than that index? If they're in the wrong spots, they'll swap. Okay, so it'll be like, oh, okay, this should have been a four, this should be the eight. And then it'll keep on moving. them. Okay. Can I? Darn. Let me use my lasso to move these. And so then it'll look at these. Okay, these are the next two things to look at. It'll move the 8 and the 2, depending on if they're in the right order. And they're not, so it'll swap them again. So now this one's 2, this one's 8. Okay, and so eventually it's going to just go through them all. It's going to look at... Uh, now it's going to look at 8 and 5. Suddenly, uh, yeah, we have to change those again. This needs to be 5, this needs to be 8. They're out of order. Uh, then... We do uh, 3 and 8, 3 is smaller and then 8. So this is slightly more sorted because the biggest number got to the end, but it's still kind of a mess over here still. Yeah. So then we go back and just do it all over again. We don't need to touch this last element anymore, but we need to touch the rest. So uh, that's what it does. It just keeps on swapping elements. And uh, the i variable keeps track of the worst number of cases of swaps that you need to do. So it's a doubly nested for loop, which sucks, and uh, so it's going to run, kind of, like it's got to go through the entire array once, swapping, and then it has to do it again on a slightly smaller array, again on a slightly smaller array. That's how it's going to work, and that comes out to uh, running the body of this inner nested for loop, running it on the order of n squared times. Okay, that's how we read that. And so it's doing constant work up in here. So this is like four things that it does. And that, uh, that becomes like, we say that's O of one, it's constant work. So uh, it's doing that though n squared times. So that's too bad. So this is slow in the world of sorting. We don't like that. So that's bubble sort. And let me show you its silly method. Let's go on. It's exchanging these pointers, exchanging things right to the right and left of each other. And notice that it's always finding that maximal element of the subarray, and it's putting it in the right spot each time. So it's, it's doing some good work. Like it's eventually getting one thing to the right spot once it finds that thing. But the rest, they're slightly less unordered, but still unordered. And so this takes quite a while to run. Uh, it's always putting the maximum in the right spot. And so I think you can see why we don't like n squared here, especially bubble sorts n squared. It's it's pretty bad. It takes a while. So it's going, it's going, it's going. Eventually it's going to get faster and faster because it has a smaller subarray to look through, but it's still just swapping things to the right and left of it. It's very, uh, it's not looking at a whole lot. It's myopic in a sense. So uh, that's bubble sort. And I'm not going to hit you too hard on any of this stuff, but just know that it it's kind of silly. Bubble sort swaps things. Selection sort uh, does the following. It's a bit better at things. It's still n squared. It takes on the order of n squared things. It's got these nested loops. But it's a bit fancier. It has a less horrible constant factor, I guess. 
So this is like, I don't know, eight, six, seven, five, three. What it's gonna do is it's going to search through the array and find the minimum, okay? So it, originally it has the entire array to search through. It'll find the minimum and swap it with the front. So it'll put it where it needs to go. So now the array is three, six, seven, five, eight. And so it has one element sorted. And then it'll go through the rest of the array and find the minimum thing there and put it to where it needs to go. And then it'll have two things sorted, okay? And so it's always keeping track of uh, a sorted subarray and then a unsorted rest of the array, okay? And so I hope that the, it, it's obvious that this is going to be a bit faster than bubble sort because it has to, I mean, it doesn't have to like look at everything to the right and left of itself. It's just going on a mission. It's finding the minimum and putting it to where it needs to go, okay? It's still going to be, if you read this code carefully, it's still going to be n squared in the worst case, but uh, slightly faster than bubble sort, okay? Less swapping involved. So let's do, oh, sorry. Pause, pause, step forward. Randomize array. Now we do selection sort. Oh, got to play it now. So watch as it fills and it finds the minimum. It's highlighting that minimum that it's looking at. It's current guess for the minimum in red. And it's putting it in the next spot where it needs to put it. It's keeping track of a sorted subarray up here. OK? It's very nice. I wish I could make this even faster, but I can't. But yeah, it's always finding the minimum, putting it in the right spot. That's what selection sort does. It's selecting the minimum. OK? So yeah, selecting the minimum, trying to fill in location i each time. Uh, yeah, less swapping involved. And so if you remember how long bubble sort took, this is still a lot less time. OK, so it's doing, doing its job, doing the thing. That's very nice. Uh, one more, that is n squared, is what's called insertion sort. And it, it works just like selection sort in that it keeps track of a sorted subarray but that sorted subarray is slightly different looking. Okay, so if it's uh, 8, 6, 7, 5, 3, this is how it works. It is keeping track of a sorted subarray of just the original elements in those places. Okay, so it's uh, if it's sorted up to index like 5 or 3, uh, let's say 3 in this case, then the first three elements of the original array are in sorted order. So it's going to worry about sorting six, seven, and eight. It's going to put it six, seven, eight in that order. And then it'll keep five and three over here still, even though they need to be put before these. Okay? Then it'll worry about, okay, putting the five, that's the next thing, in the right spot. Okay? So it's going to shift things around. And so it's that subarray, it's still sorted, but it's sorted using different numbers. For selection sort, it's sorted using the final answer for what's going to go there. For insertion sort, it's just sorting this sub array. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Uh, there should be some cool little diagrams in your book as well to make it make more sense. But uh, yeah, that's the idea. So it's uh, only worrying about for its subarrays the elements of the original array in those places, and it's putting them in sorted order. So it's not moving values that didn't exist in that range. So it's working on 0 through 2 right now. It's only working on making that sorted, what was originally there, sorted, those three things. So in the worst case, it's again n squared because it's got these nested loops. Uh, finally, it has a while loop instead of a for loop, though. That's, in, that's interesting. And the reason it has a while loop is because it only needs to move this stuff so far. Like maybe this was, I don't know, if it was 7.5, it would only need to go like right here. It, it could stop swapping things and diagrams are much easier to show this. So let's randomize the array and run insertion sort now. So it's keeping track of a sorted subarray. You can watch this be like monotonically increasing, but the rest of, uh, like still we have these small elements out here that will eventually be swapped all the way down. Okay. So insertion sort is doing its job. Insertion sort is probably the best option of all of the n squared algorithms for a reason I'm about to show you after the sorts. Insertion sort isn't always n squared, okay? It's not always going to take n squared time because this while loop might stop early. So in the best case, 
if the array is already sorted or very close to being sorted, it will take n time. This is called linear time. Okay, so I should say this up here. This is uh, now you know why it's linear search. This is uh, o of n is linear time, and o of log base two of n is called logarithmic time. I guess O of n squared is like quadratic time, things like that. Uh, so insertion sort is not always n squared because this while loop might notice like, oh yes, this array is already sorted. Like this is right here. This was a nine maybe. Like okay, yeah, it's it's not moving. It's staying right here. Next, that's the idea. Okay, cool. That is insertion sort. And so if it's already sorted, watch watch me insertion sort it again. Now just look, like yeah, everything was fine, because of the invariant that it keeps track of. It's sort of this everything to the left of its current index, its i index, is already sorted, and so it just needs to move what's next on down to where it needs to go. But if there's no down to go, then you don't have to do anything. Okay, it's already bigger, so that's insertion sort, uh, and then uh, just a couple more algorithms. They're a bit more complicated though, so. What I need to talk to you about first is what's known as divide and conquer. So uh, an algorithm is called a divide and conquer algorithm if it's recursive. So fun stuff, you have to remember recursion again, sorry. Uh, if it's recursive and the problems split evenly and don't overlap. So it's a, quite a few different, uh, different requirements. But let's pretend that we're talking about sorting arrays. OK, so a divide and conquer algorithm would take this array, split it in half. and like exactly in half, evenly, into smaller subarrays that don't overlap. And this process would continue. It would keep on recursively splitting it, recursively splitting it, right? And it would eventually solve the problem, because that's what, rec what recursion does. Eventually, it'll have a base case. And uh, you can think of the recursive cases as solving the original problem, so like sorting the arrays. And then it's your job to build up the solution using the results of those non-overlapping subproblems. So if this was an array, like it was out of order, it's wonky, a divide and conquer algorithm, a divide and conquer algorithm would recurse left, recurse right on half the array each time, like the left half and the right half. It would sort them, and then it would worry about bringing them back together into a final sorted array. Okay, so that's one way to think about divide and conquer with sorting. Okay, so that is divide and conquer. You're dividing in half, equal size problems, and then uh, they don't overlap. Like this, this is a separate part of the array than this one. That's all it means to be divide and conquer. And merge sort is exactly this diagram. So uh, it's quite nice. So uh, merge sort, let me just copy this in fact. What merge sort does is it recursively sorts the subarrays. So recursively sort. You get to assume that it's going to work. Because eventually they hit a base case like, oh, a size one subarray? That's already sorted. We're good. And then it merges them back. It has this helper function called merge that takes two sorted subarrays and merges them back. OK? And you need. You actually need a separate array to do the merging uh, for a reason, but let me just show you why merging works. So let's pretend that this sorted subarray was 1, 5, this one was 2, 3. So the merge operation just goes through both of these arrays, length n total, and just brings them together into a new array in sorted order. So it'll look at the one and the two, it'll look at the smallest elements of both to start with, and it'll pick, okay, like maybe this is i, this is j, who knows, uh, and it'll pick the smaller one, one smaller than two, this should go here, put the one. Okay, now I'm working on filling this one. I can advance i because I know it's, I've worked with the one already. Now I'll look at five and two. Now the two's smaller, so I'll put my two. Okay, so then, uh, I'll advance this j. So then I'm looking at 5 and 3. 
then I'll add the three, and then once I've added all of one, I can just add the rest of the other. So I'll put five here, and that's a sorted array. So merge is essentially a bunch of operations. It's a uh, O of n work total. Don't worry about how I'm coming up with this. This is a 41 topic. Uh, so merge is O of one, or sorry, O of n. It's a linear time thing. How many calls does merge sort make? Again, it's having the array, so how many times can you have it at most? Log base 2 of n times, and then at each, each time you're merging them back, at each level, you're doing n work. Okay, so it's n log n of an algorithm, which is much better than n squared. Oops, that's, that's the wrong side of that. There we go. So that's merge sort in a nutshell. And the reason you need a separate array, just in case you care, is uh, the merge doesn't work properly otherwise. Like if this was your 1, 5 again, and then 2, 3 came right after that, and we're merging within the same array, well, we're going to look at the 1 and the 2 again. I'll be like, oh, okay, yeah, the one is smaller, gonna keep it advance. Then look at the five and the two, and okay, yeah, the two should come before the five, so the only thing you can do is swap them to five. And now suddenly, you're looking at uh, an array that's out of order, like you're supposed to just be able to take the rest now, right? But no, you cannot. So uh, it doesn't quite work properly, unless you use a brand new shiny array to fill up, and then you just copy it back. Okay, so that's merge sort in a nutshell. Uh, quick sort in a nutshell is uh, very fancy as well, but let me actually show you merge sort. Let me show you it running faster. There we go, randomized array. It's going to recursively sort the left half, which is going to recursively sort its left half, right half. Eventually the whole left half of this array is sorted. There it goes. It's working on them down here. That's extra array. It's sorted this, and it's merging them all back together, the original two halves. Super duper fast, right? That's merge sort. It does require that extra array. Quick sort, let me just show you it running. Uh, I can try and explain it while it does. Uh, do you see the book, see the fancy... Uh, see all the animations? But quick sort, what it's doing is it's picking a number. And that's, that's what this line represents. It picks a number, and that's called its pivot. And what it's going to do is, this one doesn't actually need a separate array, but it's going to swap everything to the left side of the pivot and the right side of the pivot. So, like, uh, let, me, let me show it all over again. It's going to pick this number, and that's the pivot. So it's going to put everything smaller than the pivot over here on the left side, and then everything bigger on the right side. That's the idea. And then uh, we can recursively uh, sort like that. So that's called partitioning. Okay, so quicksort has this helper function called partition. What it does is it picks a random element of your array, like, I don't know, 4, 8, 7, 1, 2. So maybe it picks the 4. Like, sometimes you just pick the first thing. Like, if this is your pivot, it's going to work on making the rest of this array to the left, on the left side, like, it's going to put it in half, and then to the left side it's going to keep track of everything that's smaller than 4, and then on the right half it's going to keep track of everything that's greater than 4. Okay, so it's going to start like right here for the left half and over here for the right half, and it'll compare the things. So like we have 2 and 8, uh, we want everything on the left side to be smaller than 4, so we're going to swap these. Okay, this needs to be 2, this needs to be 8, and then we're going to bring this one down in. Uh, 2 and 1, well, uh, and sorry, this one should also swap. Uh, then we have 1 and 7. They're on the wrong sides of each other, so this one needs to be 1, this one needs to be 7, and now suddenly we've, we're done. And so we have 1, 2 over here, and 7, 8 over here, and in fact we know that the 4, because of the way we did this, the 4 has to go here. Okay, we found the, the resting place of the 4, and also we have two smaller subarrays. So this is now like 1, this is now 4, and so we just sort this one, sort this one, using the same idea using recursion and pivots and partitioning. So that was a lot of fancy 
a lot of words, fancy diagrams. Uh, this is not something that I'm asking you to implement in this class. It's just I want to give you a taste of it because one day you will be implementing quicksort, but not in this class. Okay, so uh, partition, yeah, it picks an element called a pivot and works to make sure that the array, it partitions it with everything less than the pivot on one side and everything greater than the pivot on the other side. Okay, and then uh, after partitioning, we know that the pivot it can always be placed in its correct spot. Uh, and then quicksort, I mean, the way that it works is it partitions and then calls quicksort twice on those smaller subarrays. That's all. So uh, if you find a good pivot, if like the pivot halves the array very nicely, you'll get n log n again. If it doesn't, if things go badly, it does have n squared in the worst case because maybe it partitioned the array like this. Okay, one size over there, the rest of the array over here. Okay, one size over here, the rest of the array over here. And it always just extracts one thing and sorts it like that. So this is gonna go all the way down to uh, n levels. That's no fun. So that is quick sort in a very, very quick nutshell. Uh, you'll read a bit more about this in your book, but hopefully now it's less intimidating, okay? Quick sort and merge sort, they're both divide and conquer algorithms. Okay, they're recursive and their problems usually split evenly. With the case of uh, quick sort, it's not always the case, but usually it's the case, and they don't overlap. Uh, in practice, even though quick sort has a bad worst case, it's greater than what it should be, uh, quick sort is faster than merge sort. Okay, because it doesn't require making a new array, uh, copying things over. So uh, usually people like to use quick sort. Okay. Uh, and that's all. That's all I have for you. So uh, what I want to show you now are just a couple exercises to help solidify these topics and then we're out of here. So uh, one thing that would be very, very helpful right now uh, would be for you to go through that brute force example that I gave with like the horses, the pigs, and the chickens. How many basic operations does that take? Figure out like, okay, is it linear and squared and n log n, log n, and cube n to the fourth. You can figure that out. I know it's possible. Uh, also, uh, one that I didn't pick, but I, I just came up with, which is a good one. Uh, take a previous lab and write a makes file to compile it. That would be very helpful. Uh, and then, uh, one that I hinted at before is make a very large random vector and then uh, time your sorting algorithms. Who's the winner on average? And maybe you can do the same with linear search and binary search, assuming you've sorted the vector for binary search. So those are some interesting exercises that you might find cool. And uh, I think that's all I have for you. So I will see you in your lab. Again, uh, I told you what you're gonna be implementing already. That is uh, finding the square root of a number by guessing. Okay, so I'll see you there.